Hilson, and I am the Substance Abuse and Addiction Project Director for the Council of State Governments Justice Center. And I want to thank everyone today for joining the National Reentry Resource Center's Second Chance Act grant webinar entitled Essential Elements of Reentry, Primary Care, and the Transition Clinics Approach. This webinar is sponsored by the U.S. Department of Justice and the Bureau of Justice Assistance. I'm going to start by reminding everyone that after the presentation, there will be time for a question and answer session. Uh, to ask a question, please type the question into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Um, you can feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar, uh, but we will be answering them at the end um, after the speakers have completed uh, going through their presentation. Um, we will do our best to answer your questions, um, but please understand that this is a very large webinar, so your questions um, may not get answered, and you can always follow up afterwards with um, the presenters individually who will provide their contact information or, of course, email us here at the Reentry Resource Center. Um, if you encounter technical or audio problems during the webinar, please call the WebEx technical support number. Uh, that number is 1-866-229-3264. Again, 866-229-3269. Uh, we understand that there are some technical issues you may not be able to resolve. Um, in the time that uh, the participate in this webinar, for this reason, we are recording the event and uh, we'll be posting the recording on the Reentry Resource Center website within a few days. The uh, URL for our website is www.nationalreentryresourcecenter.org. Today's webinar is focused on the importance of providing critical health care services to individuals as they leave incarceration and transition back into the community. Unfortunately, primary health care is often not thought of as an essential element of reentry. However, for the more than 70% of individuals with chronic medical, substance abuse, and other mental health problems, addressing, addressing health needs upon release is a challenge and important to their success in the community. Those of you who are familiar with the Reentry Resource Center may know that we have a number of different committees that help us shape our technical assistance activities. The Committee on Health, Mental Health, and Substance Use Disorders is comprised of health and criminal justice researchers, practitioners, and consumers committed to improving access to and the quality of health, mental health, and substance use disorder services for the justice-involved population. The committee has been meeting throughout the year and has assisted us in the identification of key issues as well as in the development of materials that will be useful to those of you in the field um, who are working on issues related to the intersection of health and reentry. Um, those materials include a, a couple of frequently asked questions documents that are focused on healthcare reform and the intersection of healthcare and reentry. Um, those documents uh, are scheduled to be released in the coming weeks. As part of these discussions, the committee has had a number of discussions about the essential elements to health and reentry programming and have identified five key uh, things that are essential to, um, to these programs, the first of which is to utilize the viable and valid screening and assessment tools to identify health needs. Uh, the second is matching services to individuals based on their health and other life needs. The third, providing continuity of care across the criminal justice continuum. The fourth, adopting financing and information sharing strategies that support system and service integration. And the fifth is to promote evidence-based practice, data collection, and evaluation. And today, uh, we are fortunate to have a team of individuals from Transitions Clinic who are going to demonstrate how these five elements work in practice as they prevent information about their model for providing chronically ill individuals recently released from prison with medical care and coordinated social services. Today's speakers are going to be uh, Dr. Emily Wang, who's the co-founder and director of Transitions Clinic New Haven and is a assistant professor at Yale University School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Shavit, who is the executive director of the Transitions Clinic Network. Uh, she is also an assistant clinical professor at the University of California, San Francisco. 
Uh, third, we will be hearing from Ronald Sanders, who is a senior community health worker at the Transitions Clinic in San Francisco. And finally, we will be hearing from Dr. Clement Tong, who is a co-founder of Transitions Clinic and an instructor at Harvard Medical School. We really appreciate uh, Dr. Wang and the Transitions Clinic staff taking time out of their very busy schedules to be with us today. And now I would like to turn it over to the team, and we will be starting with Dr. Wang. Thanks so much for the introduction, Alexa. Uh, today we're going to spend the next 45 minutes or so discussing uh, the importance and the value of primary care and reentry and share with you some of our work at Transitions Clinic. To start, we're going to give you some background on the health of individuals with a history of incarceration and particularly their access to health care in the community. Then we'll discuss Transitions Clinic and we'll provide some specifics about how we created the model and how it operates. We'll cover in detail the role of the community health worker uh, who is the centerpiece of our model, uh, discuss the evaluation of the transi Transitions Clinic model, and then finally end with some future directions. 700,000 uh, federal and state prisoners are released to the community in the U.S. each year, and many states have initiated programs for the early release of individuals with chronic medical conditions. Uh, as many of you uh, know, in spite of a mean age of 30, Individuals being released from prison have a disproportionate and high burden of chronic and communicable diseases, substance abuse, and mental health issues. Data on returning prisoners come mostly from studies uh, on those currently incarcerated. Several studies have already demonstrated that current and former prisoners have increased rates of chronic medical conditions uh, compared to the general population. This includes hypertension, asthma, diabetes, as well as HIV, hepatitis C, and sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, 65 to 80 percent of prisoners with substance uh, have uh, substance use or substance abuse history, and only 25 to 30 percent report being treated. 13 percent report uh, a history of severe mental illness, and many of these prisoners are diagnosed with these chronic conditions while incarcerated, so their understanding of disease and their ability to manage their conditions as well as their health care system in the community uh, is really limited to what they've learned uh, in prison. Uh, given the high prevalence of physical health, substance abuse, and mental health conditions, we really think that health care should be a universal and not a special needs concern of reentry, and that primary care ought to be central to reentry services. Uh, so the issue I find myself thinking about as a primary care physician is uh, what happens to individuals with chronic medical conditions when they leave from prison. Uh, to start, many of these patients often don't receive any discharge planning from prison. They're given a limited supply of medications and are rarely provided follow-up in the community. Upon release, uh, individuals have difficulties meeting their basic needs, and this includes finding employment, shelter, food, which are obviously critical to successful reentry. And this is augmented by systematic policy barriers to meeting these needs. Uh, so, for instance, in many states, uh, in many cities, I should say, they're unable to apply for certain jobs, and this includes all forms of public employment. Uh, additionally, in certain states, drug felons are unable to collect food stamps, WIC, uh, Pell Grants, federal student aid. They're also unable to live in Section 8 housing, uh, heightening high rates of homelessness among uh, recently released inmates, which in some cities the rates are as high as 40%. Um, and then finally, given a federal financial incentive for prisons to report when Medicaid and Medicare beneficiaries have been incarcerated, uh, if you've been incarcerated for more than a year and have had Medicaid or Medicare prior to incarceration, then in all likelihood your health insurance has been terminated and you're released without uh, insurance. And so many individuals released from prison, uh, even those who have chronic medical conditions, rank obtaining health care is actually a very low priority uh, when they're returning to the community. Uh, on top of this, individuals have significant barriers to getting their health care. Uh, one reason, as I mentioned previously, is that 85% are uninsured or don't have any financial resources for obtaining it. Uh, as a result, uh, recently released uh, inmates are more likely to use the emergency department for their health care than primary care. Uh, in one study, commonly quoted, nearly half of the men uh, and almost two-thirds of the women obtained health care in an emergency department during the 12 months prior to incarceration. And so then the question is, um, 
does this actually lead to poor transitional processes? Uh, rather, do the poor transitional processes and limited access to health care, does this actually lead to poor health outcomes? Um, in a landmark study published in the New England Journal, uh, researchers used data from a retrospective cohort of 30,000 inmates from Washington State Prison and found that, in fact, individuals released from prison had a significantly higher risk for death upon release compared to the general population. Uh, they found a 12 times increased risk of death in the first two weeks after release. Uh, and this risk of death persists uh, well over uh, into two years after release. Uh, the leading causes of death in their study were drug overdose, then cardiovascular disease, homicide, suicide, and cancer. And so uh, it's for these reasons, uh, both the clinical and the ethical, that we really felt compelled to start a clinical program for individuals released from prison with chronic medical conditions. Uh, so now Dr. Shavit's going to talk to you about Transitions Clinic and how we created this model. Thank you, Dr. Wong. So I'd just like to um, talk a little bit more about our clinic, on how we created the model, and some of the actual services that are provided. Uh, the Transitions Clinic was founded in 2006 in San Francisco, uh, founded by Dr. Wong and Dr. Hong, thinking about how can community primary care providers provide poorly specific care to recently released prisoners with chronic diseases. And in this process, um, in trying to define what is poorly specific care, Drs. Wong and Hong met with uh, community organizations and started focus groups with people with a history of incarceration to better define what is poorly specific care. And the definition they came up with was tailored care for newly released prisoners with chronic medical conditions immediately upon release and defined as within the first two weeks. Some of the really key components, there's three key components when thinking about poorly specific care. First one being culturally competent community health workers to assist with patient navigation and basic case management. Community members and fo uh, folks with a history of incarceration felt that they needed assistant nav assistance navigating community services and really needed someone who understood their experiences and were able to sort of bridge the gap between having a history of incarceration and the medical community, hence the development of a community health worker who has a history of incarceration as part of the clinic. Secondly, one of the other key components to poorly specific care is having primary care providers who have some experience or knowledge caring for patients with a history of incarceration. Uh, through focus groups and meeting with community members, we time and time again heard that many people felt embarrassed or ashamed to reveal their history of incarceration and wanted to be able to access services with individual providers who understood where they were coming from, weren't going to judge them and be able to um, adequately provide services for these individuals. And then lastly, one of the other key components was that there needed to be partnerships with existing community organizations that already serve formerly incarcerated individuals. Um, as we know that um, oftentimes there may be some services available to people returning to the community, but they can be fragmented and it's difficult for people to access care. So having partnerships with other community organizations already serving these populations was critical in services for these patients. In these meetings with the community groups as well as the focus groups, many values kind of came to the surface that we now take as our core values in this process of caring for these patients. And one of the key things is that the services need to be patient-centered, and they really need to be focused on the experiences of these individuals. As Dr. Wong mentioned, most of these individuals have had not had primary care prior to incarceration, don't have access to care in the community, have high rates of emergency room utilization. So how do we provide services that are specific for these patients, engage them into care, and value core values that will be consistent with the values of our patients so that they feel engaged and feel that they can easily access this care. So some of the core values that surfaced was that this, the model needed to be patient-centered, be culturally competent, be based in the community, and take a harm reduction approach, and also really be sort of centered around the community health worker, individuals who themselves have been incarcerated, who understand the experience and can bridge the care from patients coming out of prison. And lastly, take a broad view of health and wellness and include support in other social service needs beyond just the individual's chronic conditions. 
So this is actually a picture of two of our community health workers at the Transitions Clinic, Ron Sanders and Juanita Alvarado. And uh, you'll get to hear from Ron a little bit more about his experiences caring for this population. So as I mentioned, in 2006, the Transitions Clinic was established via focus groups with community partners and, histories, and individuals with a history of incarceration. And the clinic was established at, at a San Francisco Department of Public Health network clinic. Um, this clinic is called Southeast Health Center, and it's located in the Bayview Hunters Point. And so just to kind of give you a sense of how the clinic was developed, originally the founders were thinking about providing services for this population and were offered space near the county jail and thinking that that might work well since people might be recently released from jail, be able to access services immediately. They were seriously considering this as an opportunity. Uh, when they met with the focus groups and with community members, they actually found that this was not a good location for the clinic, that it was too close to law enforcement, and that really the clinic needed to be based in the community and specifically in the community with individuals who have a history of incarceration. And so instead decided to place the clinic at Southeast Health Center, which is in Bayview Hunters Point, which is a community in San Francisco that receives a very high rate of returning prisoners. Um, additionally, beyond just the startup of the clinic, we still to this day query our patients and we have a community advisory board who are made up mostly of individuals with a history of incarceration to help us design and better focus our policies and services for individuals with a history of incarceration. And just to give you an example, for instance, uh, we were thinking about providing care for patients, and one of the things that comes up in this patient population is that we see very high rates of chronic pain. And we're based at a community health center, Southeast Health Center, and they have a specific policy around pain management, which includes signing pain agreements and doing urine toxins on patients to monitor to make sure they're taking their medications. And they asked us to follow their policy, but we wanted to make sure that patients felt comfortable with this, uh, specifically because our patients are parolees. They oftentimes are required to have urine toxicology testing at the parole office, and we didn't want it to feel as if we were replicating parole or that we were going to punish the patients in some way. So we talked with our community advisory board and worked out a good compromise between the clinic and our clinic to make sure that patients felt comfortable seeking services at our clinic. So just to outline a little bit more about the type of services we provide, uh, we initially provide transitional care. So immediately upon release, within the first two weeks, we see patients right away in the clinic. Uh, we can provide medication refills, fill out paperwork. Oftentimes people need clearance if they're looking for employment. Um, and then we make referrals to primary care providers. Um, in addition to transitional care, we, we provide ongoing primary care for our patients and their families. So whether they see us at the transitions clinic or go on to another clinic, um, we provide ongoing primary care for our patients and their families. And at the clinic, beyond just the transitional care and primary care, we have other on-site services, as you can see, like dental care, podiatry, optometry. Um, many other services that are very key to supporting these patients. And because it's often difficult for our patients to navigate the healthcare system, it's very critical to have a lot of these services on site, as many as possible, to better support our patients and the management of their chronic conditions and other comorbidities. So as I mentioned, the community health workers are really key to the services in our clinic. And so beyond the primary care services we provide, we also provide linkages to community resources through the community health workers. And we try and address some of the social service needs our patients have when being returned to the community. So for instance, things like Medicaid reinstatement can be very challenging. Our community health workers help patients navigate this. Um, we help make connections to substance abuse treatment programs, vocational rehabilitation, mental health services, housing referrals, tattoo removal, legal aid, and other community advocacy groups. So the clinic, um, as I mentioned, was started in 2006, and since then we've seen over 500 unduplicated patients. Uh, we now run clinic three to four, one half days a week, and see about 10 to 12 patients a session. And when we first started the clinic, uh, 
really we were meant as an open access clinic, seeing patients immediately upon release, having open appointments so patients could come and see us when they needed to. And as patients started coming, we would either refer them on to primary care or continue to see them in our clinic for primary care. And what we found was that the model was so successful that patients didn't want to go anywhere else for primary care, and many wanted to stay to continue to get their care at the clinic and bring their families to see us as well. So we've maintained the same number of open access appointments for intakes upon release and then continue to grow the clinic to support ongoing primary care for patients and their families. Um, we're staffed by a physician and nurse practitioner and have two full-time community health workers. And the community health workers manage about 30 to 40 active patients at one time. And as patients are further and further from their release from prison, they become more and more stable in the community. And so the community health workers try to work with them, help build their skills to be successful in the community, and then over time need to actively manage them less. And then for our patients, most of our patients coming out of prison are uninsured, and so we were able to provide coverage for them through Healthy San Francisco, which is a county program, um, as we are based in a safety net, safety net clinic through San Francisco General. So I'd like to just review a little bit about what happens in the clinic, and more specifically the initial visit, so that you can get a sense of what are some of the things that we're dealing with with our patients when they're first released. The initial visit is a longer visit, and it's usually about takes about 45 minutes. Um, and of course, we assess people's medical needs, think about their chronic diseases, making sure they have refills of their medications. But as Dr. Wong mentioned, our patients also have high rates of substance abuse and mental health disorders. So we do mental health screening and substance abuse assessment and referrals, making sure that individuals are linked to appropriate services. Um, also, since we know that individuals have high-risk behaviors while incarcerated, including sexual activity, tattooing, and drug use, we also uh, do counseling and testing for infectious diseases. We also assess what are the social service needs of our patients when they're first coming out, such as housing or employment, and make appropriate referrals and the community health workers to help our patients navigate those systems. Uh, additionally, patients with chronic diseases often need specialty care, and we make referrals to that as well. Um, I think some of the other really critical pieces of this visit is really kind of trying to get a sense of what is going on with these individual patients and what their specific needs are. So this is our opportunity to really tailor a plan to our, these individuals based on their chronic disease, substance abuse, and mental health needs, as well as their social service needs. Um, for instance, just to give you a sense of kind of how this plays out, our patients vary um, depending on their experience in prison. So, for instance, we may have patients who have spent 20 years in prison and are coming back to San Francisco for the first time in 20 years. So things like navigating the city and just managing basic um, access to services can be very challenging for these patients. Additionally, our patients have different levels of experience in accessing healthcare services and different levels of literacy. So we've seen patients come out of prison who are illiterate, who were diagnosed with multiple chronic conditions for the first time, and then are contending with how do they fill their medications, how do they take their medications, and better understanding what's happening with them. And then lastly, we always ensure that the patients are going to have primary care follow-up, either with us or with another clinic of their choice. So. The clinic was initially started to support people when they first came back from prison. And Dr. Wong will highlight some of the findings from our evaluation, but one of the things that we kept seeing time and time again were that our patients were being seen in the emergency room before they ever made it to the transition clinic. And that really highlighted for us that there needed to be more continuity or better transitional care from the prison back to the community. And so we started outreaching into San Quentin State Prison, which is our local prison, which actually the majority of our patients are coming from. And we've been able to connect with patients before they parole to help them better transition to the community. Uh, by doing this, we make sure that we can actually access their medical records because in general, if we try to get records from the prison, it can take up to 30 days. So if we have the information for the patient's needs, prior to release, we can begin a treatment plan for them prior to return to the community. 
So in that way, we have much better continuity. Um, for instance, there was a patient that we cared for who needed spinal surgery, and because he was so close to being released from prison, the, the prison didn't provide the treatment that he needed, and we were able to get copies of his scans, get him into our neurosurgeon, and he had surgery within two weeks of his release from prison. Um, also, if we start our outreach in the prison, we can avoid inappropriate health care utilization, prevent unnecessary emergency room visits, and last, we really want to reduce the risk. Of, as Dr. Wong mentioned, people are at high risk of death upon release, and if we can help connect them to services before they return to the community, hopefully mitigate some of this risk. Also, through this connection with the prison, we've realized that we can have better communication with not just the providers, but our patients during their incarceration. Um, as we know, in California, we have very high rates of recidivism, up to 70%. And so the reality is, as many of our primary care patients from transition clinic do go back to prison. And so by having better communication with the prison, we're, be, we're able to better care for our patients upon return, able to support our colleagues in the prison in providing better care to our patients while they're there. So now we're going to take some time to shift to really talk about the crux of the clinic, sort of the most important piece really is the role of the community health worker. And I'm going to introduce Ron Sanders, who is our senior community health worker. And as you can see, um, Ron is greatly admired and adored by our patients at the Transitions Clinic. Um, and he really makes a huge difference. People feel it's a blessing to have him there and that he goes out of his way. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Ron so he can tell you a little bit more about the work that he does. Thank you, Dr. Shavit. Uh, yes, my name is Ryan Sanders, and uh, I'm going to talk about the role of uh, community health workers, uh, patient-centered, culturally appropriate care. Uh, we do outreach, patient navigator, referrals, support, substance use counseling, health education, and chronic disease self-management. Um, this is a quote from one of our, for two of our clients. Uh, this was done for um, uh Kind of skip. But uh it was and uh they don't judge you, they treat you like a human being, like you're still a person. That's something that prison takes away from you. And when you get out of society takes it away from you. I think that's what makes transition clinics so successful. The first time I went in there transition it was like I was coming home. Even though we are ex cons and I've been in prison, we are still human beings. The, uh, the people at transition treat us like human beings. You know, a lot of our clients said it is like uh it's like a family. You know, and uh, they never had that before. And, you know, a lot of them are estranged from their family, so we you know we're like the, you know, we are their family. So um, some of the role, the, the role of the community health worker, outreach, uh, meeting our patients where they are at, literally. You know, we do a mandatory parole meeting every Tuesday, and uh, we do a presentation about the clinic, and then uh, at the end we sign up uh, the ones just getting out of relief with uh, chronic diseases. And uh, we try to get in within the first two weeks, which is very important. As, um, and we're also, we go to their home, we visit, we do home visits, check on them. We go to jails, prisons, uh, we go to the hospitals, visit, we go to treatment facilities. Uh, and this is probably my favorite one, is going to the streets, it's going to the communities, you know, looking for clients we haven't seen in a while, or, you know, just checking on ones. Because usually I'm like a celebrity in some ways. Because I'm, like, known all over San Francisco when it comes to the parole population. So, you know, wherever I go, I'm kind of, like, known. And it's good to, you know, get out there, especially the ones we haven't seen in a while. I usually run into them and get them back into care. Uh, patient navigator, a guy for the complex medical system. Uh, a lot of clients, you know, they have problems trying to get, you know, they're just getting out. And with the medical system, it gets a little frustrated for them, you know. They might go to the pharmacy and their medication is not ready. They don't know what to do. So they'll call me and I'll guide them through it. You know, and then, uh, health insurance sometimes is a problem too because maybe it didn't go through. And, you know, they start getting frustrated. They've been standing in line and they don't know what to do. They call me and I usually get it ran through again for them and it takes care of it. And, uh, to the appointments, you know, I call to make sure that they're, they're making their appointments and, you know, try to, Remind them, because they have a lot going on, you know, because once you get released, you know, you're worried about your housing, you're worried about, you know, employment, you, then you got to check in with the parole agent, you got so many things going on, you know, so we try to remind them about uh, uh, their medical appointments. And uh, these other things, we do referrals for housing, employment, job training, 
education, and other social services. Um, I've been working in this field for nine years with our parolees, and then plus my own personal battle. So I, own, I know every referral there is when it comes to housing, employment, and anything for a parolee. And uh, support, my cell phone is a, it's a 24-hour hotline, and I, I think I get more calls than the president. So I'm available by day, night, and they know it. So, you know, they call me. And, you know, a lot of times it has nothing to do with medical. It might be doing about, you know, how do I uh, uh, interact with my parole agent, you know, uh, and all kind of issues, you know, family, having family problems, uh, you know, just, just problems. So they just call me, I talk, and I give advice, you know, and that's more the emotional support and advice related to medical issues. And uh, the challenges, you know, because there's a lot of barriers. And uh, educating pa- patients about their chronic diseases, especially new diagnosis. You know, a lot of a lot of them are getting new diagnoses that they know anything about. You know, diabetes, hypertension, asthma. You know, uh, Hep C. There's a lot of them. You know, so they call. They want the uh, information on it. You know, how do I check my sugar? You know, uh, certain medications. You know, how do I take it? When do I take it? And then we have chronic disease self-management, and then that's basically the same thing as health education. So we try to like teach them so they become self-reliant, and uh, so they can handle their own medical. And um, this is a chart. It shows the first year and a half before we were hired, and then as you see the chart of April of '07 when I got hired, the uh, the rate of new uh, new patients uh, soared. You know, and and lately we were still been doing it. So it's even a better job than this now, you know, because our motto is to get them in within the first two weeks. So, you know, uh, we have to, a lot of times we have to flip the schedule, you know, move people around to try to get the new ones in. It's very important. If you don't get them in in the first two weeks, a lot of times we lose them. So it's very important to get them in in the first two weeks. We do everything we can to get them in. So um, I will be uh, switch. I'll be uh, turning it to Clemens. Emily, evaluating the transition clinic model. Great. So as Ron was just saying, you know, our, uh, after hiring Ron and the community health worker, our clinic really began to grow. And what we started thinking about was our plans for sustainability uh, and specifically realized that any plans for sustaining the clinic really would require data on the efficacy of the clinic. Um, so we decided uh, that to use community-based participatory research uh, this approach to uh, help us evaluate the clinic. Uh, briefly, CBPR, uh, it's defined by the Kellogg Foundation as a collaborative process that equitably involves all partners in research, both the community and the researchers, uh, and recognizes the unique strengths that each brings to the research process. Uh, given that our clinical efforts at Transitions Clinic have been successful in large part given the participation of the community, it was really important that our evaluation was at well. That it, uh, that it included the community uh, in all stages from the design, implementation, and hopefully dissemination. And so uh, CBPR, the first step of it is always defining kind of who our community is. And for us, this included, uh, as we've discussed previously, our patients, uh, the community organizations with whom we've partnered, uh, as well as government officials and policymakers. Uh, who would be uh, important decision makers in terms of thinking about the long-term sustainability of our clinical programs. Uh, For us, this includes leadership in the Department of Public Health, the Public Defender's Office, and the Mayor's Office, as well as California state legislators. Uh, And so the next step was thinking about uh, the outcomes that we're going to look at. Uh, As you can imagine, uh, different members of our community were interested in very different outcomes. Our patients, they were interested in measuring improvements in how they felt, their satisfaction with the clinical services. And when we talked to policymakers, they were interested in, you know, whether this parolee-specific care that we have at Transitions Clinic, if it was improving things like primary care utilization, acute care utilization, a return to jail, all things that basically cost the city. And as doctors, we were really interested in all these endpoints, as well as thinking about clinical outcomes like blood pressure, sugar levels, uh, et cetera. And after some uh, discussion, our uh, our patients uh, and community partners really agreed that the utilization outcomes were probably the most important endpoints to look at, given that our primary ends were thinking about how we would sustain the clinic uh, and 
also given that uh, the prospect of the clinic might be sustained by city government funds would be greater if we were to show that Transitions Clinic made a difference in healthcare utilization uh, as well as recidivism. And so we set out to answer the question, does totally specific care at Transitions Clinic improve primary care utilization, acute care utilization, and return to jail? So the next step uh, in our evaluation was uh, choosing a study design. And we certainly wanted the most rigorous evaluation of the clinic, which was going to be a randomized control trial. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, given uh, considerations of a randomized control trial, it wasn't going to be ethical to randomize participants to either care at transitions versus usual care, which prior to the clinic opening was uh, no transitional care at all. Uh, and so again, through a lot of discussion, what we agreed uh, between patients, our community advisory board, as well as our um, our uh, partners within the city, Department of Public Health, uh, and uh, policymakers, was that what we would do was look at transitions clinic compared to an expedited visit uh, within the safety uh, net system. And so everyone would still get their transitional clinic visit uh, within two weeks of release, but then they would be randomized to stay either in parolee-specific care and transitions or uh, an expedited visit within the uh, public health care system in San Francisco. So starting in 2007, we began enrollment in the study, uh, in the study uh, and among 206 uh, participants who were assessed for eligibility, 200 underwent randomization. Uh, and so just to present some of our results from the evaluation, uh, at baseline, what we found not surprisingly was that the majority of participants, they were black, uh, male, and poor. 90% had two or more chronic medical conditions, and this includes, of course, physical health conditions as well as substance uh, abuse or mental health issues. 40% of our patients were first diagnosed with their chronic condition while in prison, uh, and then 67% used the emergency department as a regular source of care prior to incarceration. And so these statistics very much parallel those that are seen in other studies as well as uh, in a national level. In turning to their uh, transitional care uh, or discharge planning, 32% uh, of our participants, uh, patients, didn't have, a medica didn't have their medication upon release, uh, and 80% did not have a scheduled follow-up, uh, so they didn't have an appointment uh, in the community prior to being discharged from the prison. Uh, and as Dr. Shavit mentioned earlier, what we found was that 14% of participants had already visited the emergency department before their two-week visit uh, at Transitions Clinic. So we were able to give them a two-week visit, and still yet 14% of the participants had already gone to the emergency department, really uh, uh, bringing to the forefront the importance of improving the connection between the prison and the community and that discharge planning needs to happen while individuals are still in prison. And so in turning to our primary outcomes, we looked at their 12-month outcomes for primary care utilization, emergency department utilization, and hospitalizations. Uh, and so what you can see if you look at the first row of this table is that 63% of participants had two or more visits with their primary care physician within 12 months after their first uh, transitional visit. Uh, this is remarkably high given, again, like I said, that uh, other national studies have found that the rates of primary care engagement upon release are far lower. Uh, there were no differences between the two arms uh, in terms of primary care utilization. Uh, if you look at the second row, looking at emergency department utilization, uh, what you can see is that the emergency department utilization rates are far lower, again, what they, um, compared to what the participants reported prior to incarceration, uh, and that transitions clinic patients reported lower rates of emergency department utilization compared to those randomized to the community health clinic. So it's 25% compared to 40% of individuals, uh, and this difference was statistically significant. And finally, uh, in comparing hospitalization rates, 12% of all participants were hospitalized, and there was no difference between the two arms of the study. So in turning to return uh, and looking at their time to arrest, this here is a Kaplan-Meier curve, and essentially what it does is compare the times to arrest among those randomized to transitions clinic uh, compared to those randomized to the community health clinics. Um, on the y-axis, you just have the proportion of participants who remained in the study, uh, and 
on the x-axis, you have uh, time. And essentially, to interpret this graph, essentially the sharper the uh, line drops, the more individuals have returned to the jail. And so what you can uh, have returned to jail. And so what you can see here basically is looking uh, in the two groups, turns it down, I apologize that this didn't show up very clearly, but um, in both uh, groups, transitions clinic is actually the one in red, the lower one, the slope is essentially the same. They were turned, uh, they, the time to arrest is essentially the same in both groups, and there's no statistically significant difference in either arm. Um, what I do want to uh, just caution you here is that uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a difference in recidivism. As you guys all know, uh, how we define recidivism is very different, and this is just looking at initially at time to arrest. Uh, what this doesn't say is whether or not there's any difference between the two uh, groups in terms of an actual uh, new conviction, uh, return to prison, uh, which are obviously important uh, criminal justice outcomes. And so what we conclude, uh, can conclude from uh, this randomized control trial is that first, uh, recently released individuals uh, do engage and remain in primary care if given early access to care. I think our data show quite compellingly that the rates of primary care engagement are higher uh, compared to their self-reported uh, previous engagement in prior, primary care uh, before they were incarcerated, as well as to national rates of primary care uh, utilization post-release. Uh, secondly, that a parolee-specific care transitions clinic uh, does reduce emergency department visits. Uh, and so, uh, again, this is probably, you know, 15% reduction uh, between the two arms is a, a quite sizable reduction in thinking about this uh, young population that does use the emergency department uh, repeatedly. Uh, and finally, what we found was that parolee-specific care doesn't seem to reduce arrest rates. And so uh, we believe our model works for four reasons. Uh, the first is that it is patient-centered and culturally appropriate. Uh, individuals released from prison have played an important role in the design of the clinic, the adaptation of the clinic, as well as the evaluation. Our clinic is staffed with individuals who are truly attuned to the culture of prison and of reentry. Uh, secondly, there's a real strong community presence in our clinic, uh, without whom our clinic just simply wouldn't run. Um, thirdly, we've learned from past studies and are really committed to generating our own data to guide our clinical practices. Uh, and then finally, uh, our model just doesn't require much startup, as you have heard from the presentation with Dr. Shavit and Ron. Uh, it's integrated into the safety net healthcare system, uh, and there's a lot of on-site resources that are already available. Uh, and so we believe that it's replicable in other safety net systems with community or context appropriate modifications. So we've described our model, um, Sun Kwan and Song. Um, so we've described our model, how it came to be, and showed some preliminary evidence um, of its effectiveness. And I'd like to briefly review the context for replication and dissemination of this model and begin to discuss future opportunities and directions in the care of this population. As many of you are probably aware, um, there's considerable pressure to address the needs of this complex population and disseminate models like ours. Our current system simply isn't working to provide adequate care for these individuals after release. The risk of death post-release is alarming, and there's an increasing need and high demand for medical care following release. The pressure has been increasingly applied by overcrowded position, uh, prisons, high rates of recidivism, and early release, as well as the increasing rate of chronic disease. Nationally, there's a focus on the triple aim of better health, better care, and, be and at lower costs. Better health and better care for these vulnerable patients, their families, and their communities, with emphasis on increased equity and reduction of health and health care disparities, and reduced costs, which is particularly critical now in the setting of constrained state and federal budgets and ever-increasing health care costs and Medicare expenditures. So the question before us is, how can we support the integration of the Transitions Clinic model and others like it into all community health centers and safety net systems that care disproportionately for these populations in order to achieve better care and better health and reduce costs for our government and society at the same time? We believe there is currently an opportunity, particularly coming from the context of health care delivery, given the landmark health care legislation passed earlier this year. Although there are other opportunities, we'll focus our discussion here on the opportunities presented by the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. 
Over the next 10 years, we will see significant coverage expansion, including Medicaid expansion, and essentially everyone at post-release will be eligible for health care coverage. Providing care for these patients will be increasingly important in the context of accountable care and cost containment. The incarcerated and formerly incarcerated population is a group of high, with high rates of comorbid chronic medical, mental, and behavioral health illness, high rates of preventable emergency department utilization and hospitalization, as well as low rates of primary care access and utilization. Accountable care organizations and other models will increasingly need to focus resources on and develop models of care for these patients to improve care and reduce costs and they will be investing in infrastructure to do this. Further, considerable investments in community health centers and primary care infrastructure, including the patient center medical home, will provide badly needed funding to build and strengthen infrastructure in underserved areas and support programs that address the needs of our most vulnerable, complex, and high-cost patients. Finally, CDC grants for community health workers in the bill written to specifically target issues surrounding the care of vulnerable patient groups, demonstrate an increasing awareness of the potential benefits of incorporating community health workers, essential components of health care delivery here in the United States. Though not part of the bill, there are also demonstration projects underway, including Medicaid demonstration projects to demonstrate the benefits of community health workers and health care delivery in both disease-specific and comprehensive ways. In this context, we started to take small steps towards disseminating our model and supporting others who are embarking on the care of formerly incarcerated individuals. We will publish and disseminate results from our clinic evaluation in order to raise awareness both of the needs of this population and begin conversations on models for improving care for individuals who are returning home. We will support the adaptation and replication of the Transitions Clinic model and work to integrate it into community health delivery nationally. We currently know of clinics based on our model in New Haven, Rhode Island, Bronx, New York, and Oakland, and we know plans are underway in many other cities and counties, including Boston and Contra Costa County. In order to support the success and dissemination of these models of care, we will create infrastructure to educate and train healthcare providers and community health workers nationally on our model and in culturally competent care delivery to this population. We will accomplish this through the creation of a national network of transitions clinics. The transitions, the transitions Clinic um, Network, um, what we will do is in order to, to support the success of this, we'll create this network. Um, to this end, um, our aim is to support enhanced models of care delivery for this population nationally. We will create a learning collaborative that will allow us to share best practices through webinars, publications, newsletters, conferences, and other modalities educate and train primary care providers, administrators, and community health workers through informal consultation, curricula de delivered through web-based modalities, as well as on-site educational opportunities for community health workers. The network will enable us to coordinate funding, evaluation, and research by partnering with other organizations providing transitional health care to this population, and create a nationally representative advisory board consisting of a high proportion of formerly incarcerated individuals to ensure community engagement throughout the process. There are numerous challenges to the creation of transitional care delivery models. First and foremost, they will need to be tailored to each setting in which it is developed. Within each locale, there will be a dependence on the safety net delivery systems, and the quality of any different intervention will be subject to resource limitations in local infrastructure. Most safety net delivery systems have considerable resource limitations and often poor infrastructure, leading to fragmented delivery of care. Within this realm are medical, mental, and behavioral health services but also critically important social services and programs. Coordinating all of these services and reducing fragmentation is a major challenge for these systems. Reaching and engaging formerly incarcerated individuals also continues to pose difficulties, as does the current lack of timely health insurance coverage following release in most settings. Even if the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act provides an opportunity for coverage, we need to ensure that this coverage is acceptable, accessible and seamless. Training all providers in the provision of culturally competent care for this population will also be a challenge. How do we find a way to maintain focus on all the needs of this population and delivery systems that will have less of a focus on this population when compared to the transitions plan? As we attempt to disseminate our model, we will need to address considerable differences in culture, leadership, and environment in different settings. In this regard, obtaining buy-in from safety net and community health centers and providers will be critical. Finally, obtaining of sustainable funding for community health workers is a major challenge, as we believe they are an essential part of an effective healthcare delivery system for these patients. 
Some policy changes will undoubtedly be catalysts for improving care for this population. While this is not clearly an exhaustive list, we believe a few policy measures would be important first steps. We need to find a way to ensure continuous health insurance coverage for these patients. This could occur through continued coverage under Medicaid through incarceration or through mandates for uninterrupted health insurance coverage for individuals as they return home. We need to create sustainable funding mechanisms for community health workers and fund training programs. We need to emphasize the value of these team members by making it a profession and creating opportunities for their professional training, growth, and advancement. These funding mechanisms may come through educational grants to, to create training programs and increase support of primary care and community health center infrastructure and through reimbursement mechanisms that fund healthcare teams rather than visits to the doctor. We must create and fund more coordinated reentry services in all areas with high incarceration rates. These reentry centers must be integrated with healthcare and social service delivery systems in the area to reduce fragmentation of care and address all the needs for these patients. And activities must be directed and informed by community advisory boards that have a majority representation of incarcerated individuals or formerly incarcerated individuals. In conclusion, prison community transitions are a high risk period for poor health outcomes. Primary care is an essential part of reentry. The transitions clinic approach is effective and evidence based. The key components of our model are culturally competent healthcare workers, including a community health worker, and early access to healthcare post release ensuring a continuity of care between prison and the community. This model can be integrated into safety net delivery systems in the context of health reform, and the Transitions Clinic may help get us there. Doesn't everyone in the picture look pretty pleasant and approachable? Um, we invite you all to engage with us either today or down the line as we work together to address the needs of these individuals. Our, own, our contact information will be on the last slide. We'd like to acknowledge our funders and thank Alexa, Sean, and the National Reentry Resource Center for inviting us to present our model to you. Thank you, and we'd be happy to take questions from you at this time. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Uh, I just want to remind people that if you would like to um, ask a question, uh, just type your question into the Q&A channel on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Um, and we had a number of questions come through during the presentation, so I am going to start um, with the question and answer session. Um, one of the first questions that we got early on was how you assess that your agency is successfully adhering to a client-centered model. I think one of the most uh, uh, kind of prominent ways that we've done that is uh, both through continued focus group with our patients, uh, either, you know, structured interviews, just talking to them individually, uh, and these are led not by us, not by physicians or community health workers, but by members of our community advisory board, um, or, you know, group focus interviews where we address certain clinical questions we're interested in, asking like the urine toxicology question uh, that Dr. Shavit mentioned. Uh, we also brought that to our patients. Would they feel stigmatized by our clinic if this, uh, if we did have to do urine toxicology in that clinic? And so uh, I think the key way that we've been able to address this is by putting our patients front and center and thinking about our clinical practices, asking them how we're doing, um, trying to do it in a non-biased way by asking our community advisory board to participate in this process, and then having focus groups that are very uh, that are regularly continuing to see how we're doing. Great, thank you. Um, a few questions came in specific to the operation of the clinic, I believe in San Francisco. Um, one of the first ones was specific to the services offered um, and wanting uh, to know if HIV testing was included and the testing you referenced. Um, and whether you have a uh, opt-out um, option available for people in the care model. Great. I'm happy to address that. Uh, we do provide HIV testing to all of our patients when they first come to the clinic, and um, it's not really a traditional opt-out testing in the sense that 
uh, we don't just automatically test everyone unless they decide not to be tested, but in actuality, it's really we use it as an opportunity as well for education and for uh, talking about harm reduction methods. So in part of the initial assessment, we sit down and talk about everybody's risk uh, with them to get a better sense of what their needs are, do a lot of education, and then offer them HIV testing um, and discuss kind of how high their risk is based on behaviors and also past testing and just use it as an opportunity for education and, and offer people. Um, everyone does have an offer and, and they can choose to get the test or not and we usually use a verbal consent methodology. Great, thank you. Um, a question came through uh, wanting to uh, have uh, more information about the um, partnership that you may have with vocational rehabilitation or other job training, um, but specific to voc rehab. Um, if you have a sense for what types of clients can use that system, um, whether there are any waiting list issues, um, do clients have any difficulty accessing uh, that specific uh, service? Uh, now, uh, as long as they're on parole, they can access any one of the services. I usually uh, have a lot of them set up to do, uh, because uh, in California, there's a green tech, so a lot of them are signed up, uh, going through classes, job training, and everything. As long as you're on parole, you know, and you, you go through the uh, job training, the educational part, you know, you get in, and then they're making pretty good money. Thank you. Um, additional questions about the San Francisco Clinic. Um, the training that Ron, you and the other healthcare workers received, there were a few questions about um, what that looks like. And uh, I think at the end there was reference sort of um, their being interested in credentialing. So if you could talk about um, the training the community health workers receive um, and other sort of requirements or background that, that uh, is helpful for the position. Great. Yeah, I think um, I can address that a little bit. Um, I think when, when this model was first developed, there was a realization that there was a need for specific training for primary care providers and community health workers to better serve this patient population. And what we didn't talk at all about when we talked about setting up the model was a partnership that we did set up with City College of San Francisco and a community advocacy group called Legal Services for Prisoners with Children. And together as a group, um, we established uh, an organization to work to address training for community health workers. And so through our organization, we're able to develop specific training for community health workers at City College. So it's a one-year certificate program that's based out of the regular one-year certificate program at City College, but is specifically focused to training community health workers to work with previously incarcerated individuals. And the name of that community health worker certificate is the Post-Prison Health Worker Certificate and has now been implemented at City College in San Francisco. So we actually train, our, both of our community health workers have gone through that program, have completed their training, have a certificate, and we also, as a continuation of that program, um, our community health workers and ourselves actually teach in that program, uh, continue to work with City College, and we take interns from the program. So one of the requirements is that people going through the program uh, do an internship with a community-based organization that serves recently released prisoners. So we have, every year, we have interns who are rotating with us through the clinic. Okay. Uh, while we're on that topic, uh, the question came through asking how you prevent burnout among your community health workers. I think that's a great question. Um, it's a challenge uh, caring for this patient population. I think one of the key things is that we work as a multidisciplinary team. Um, so the burden is not solely on the community health worker, but on other providers in the clinic, and that includes the primary care providers, but also some of the other staff at the clinic, including social workers, um, and other providers at the clinic who, mental health providers who are involved in the case of the patient. So sometimes we meet as a group, discuss the cases to better support the community health workers. Um, additionally, we uh, recently have hired another full-time community health worker to prevent burnout so that the community health workers can support each other, share the work, and are continually making sure that we don't overburden them with too many patients. Um, and some of the other things we do is have them continually develop their skills. So, for instance, 
be involved in teaching at City College, uh, supervising the interns as they come through the clinic, and also being involved in changing policy and working with the community to improve services for this patient population to get sort of a bigger picture perspective. And just to give you an idea, Ron is actually uh, sits on the reentry council here in San Francisco, so he's able to share his experiences with the broader community to help implement changes in how we do things in San Francisco. So those are some of the key things that we do to try and help prevent burnout and continue to support the development of our community health workers. Um, there are a few questions about the funding for your program, um, sort of how you're funded, which I think you touched on a little bit. Um, but in addition, sort of approximating what your budget looks like, um, are you able to benefit from um, if you talk a little bit more about the uh, the funding piece, oh, and whether or not you had received any specific legislative um, support for the uh, clinic model. So our funding, as you saw in one of our last slides, primarily comes from uh, private foundations, in, mostly in the Bay Area, but nationally as well. And, and also, really, uh, the main chunk of our funding comes from the San Francisco Department of Public Health, and most of that funding is in-kind donations. So we're based in a safety net clinic, um, so we have access to all the services of the safety net. So by being based in that clinic, our patients have access to many more services um, than we get uh, uh, a very large amount of support from the San Francisco Department of Public Health, which is difficult to quantify in a specific number. Um, but just to give a sense, the part that we fundraise for, that we get support from private foundations, is for the support of our primary care providers and mainly the community health workers and special programs that we may have for our patients. So. Uh, that hopefully will give most people a sense of, and really kind of the idea of this model can be implemented in pre-existing community clinics that doesn't necessarily need to be a, a brand new clinic starting from scratch. It can really be tailored to the community and be integrated into the services that already exist, and in that way you're sort of leveraging services that exist, maximizing services for your patients, and minimizing um, how much funding you would need to support the remainder of the clinic. Great. While we're on that, um, I've got a few questions talking about uh, replication of the clinic model in a range of settings. Um, so whether it may be smaller communities, rural communities, tribal communities, um, any thoughts about how, what the model would look like in, in um, different communities? Clemens, you want to take a stab at that? or? Sure. I mean, I, I think that when you uh, look at the model, it, it is a model that's integrated into the safety net delivery system in San Francisco. So really when you look uh, nationally at both rural and, ur rural and urban settings, um, it is something that uh, with some training and potentially some additional funding for community health work could be implemented essentially in any setting. Um, when you think nationally in the, in, the, uh, in the setting of how this could be funded, I think that there are a lot of uh, changes happening on a national scale that could support the, the uh, replication and dissemination of this type of model. And I think, as I stated during the presentation, there's going to be a lot of um, uh, impetus to do this and uh, potential opportunity as well. Um, I think rurally there are um, uh, additional challenges in terms of the distances um, that people have to travel and whether the community health worker models can work in uh, specific rural settings. Um, that's an additional issue that needs to be considered. I think um, there are models for rural health delivery um, and when you look generally at primary care that are being implemented currently, uh, for instance, in Vermont and other settings that are using community health workers. So it isn't um, out of the question that it's a possibility, but those challenges would clearly need to be addressed. Um, I guess that would be sort of a start to answer. I don't know if anyone else has anything else to add. Okay, great. Thank you. And, um, to um, the, of the patients at the clinic, um, the black question came through about whether or not your female patients um, have different or distinct needs from uh, your male patients. Um, I'm going to actually, I'm going to 
repeat that question and then pass the phone over to Ron. So the question was asking about our female patients and if they have distinct needs that are different than the male clients in the clinic. Um, yeah, in some ways, yes. Yeah, but, but I think they, usually when it comes to the female clients, usually uh, the majority of them are paroled over to Treasure Island at a full pro a program. It's more difficult for the males than it is the females, I think, a lot of times. I think the uh, females have more services over at Treasure Island, but when it comes to medical, it's a little, you know, you know, they, you know, we provide that. So other than that, they have more, they have, uh, drug, drug, uh, counseling and everything right over there. It's just, it's just the medical part they don't have. Uh, but I think the, uh, uh, federal inmates, uh, female inmates might have, you know, is few of them, but they, you know they uh, rely on us more than the state does. Um, and just to add to that as well, I mean, I think you know some of our female patients have children that are either in their custody or not in their custody. That's often an issue. Sort of trying to reunify families or support families is really difficult. Um, but we do still face that problem with our male patients as well. Um, it's usually not as much of an issue. I think one of the other things that we often see with the female patients are really high rates of, of trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, domestic violence, um, and trying to address those issues. And then I think actually in some ways we have more support in the community because of the awareness of some of those issues for our female patients. Um, but we, again, also see very high rates of trauma in our male patients as well and, and do struggle sometimes to find services for them in the community. Thanks, and you actually started to touch on uh, two other issues that have come through via the questions, um, the first of which is uh, the proportion of your patients uh, that are family members to parolees. Are you serving uh, family members as well as the individuals um, themselves who are on parole? Yeah, actually, we are. And I, um, I don't have the specific number, but it's very low. I mean, it's probably, let's say, less than you know, 10% of our total patients that we see. Um, we really are trying to bring families together and see family members, so we let our patients know that we'll see them. Um, you know, I'm a family physician, so we're able to do prenatal care as well and take care of children. Um, but what we're finding, interestingly, is that our patients, because they're mostly male and have been in and out of prison, oftentimes are estranged from their family members and have very little social support. So they don't always have family members to bring into the clinic. And this is sort of where the community advisory board really kind of came into play early on where, you know, there were thoughts of, well, why don't you go to the family members of people who are incarcerated and connect with patients that way. And that is one way to do it, but it's also reaching a different group of individuals because many of our patients actually are single men who have very little connection to their family. And, and as Ron mentioned, we become their family. We become their support. Uh, they've burned bridges with many other people in their lives, um, but we're always still there for them. So um, in that sense, you know, we're trying to uh, help support people to reconnect with their family and bring them into the clinic, but uh, it's a small percentage of what we do. Uh, the second issue that uh, came through via a question that you uh, could touched on as well um, in regards to your work with uh, your local community partners is there's a question about um, how the program has been accepted by the community and whether or not you have had to deal with any uh, so-called NIMBY issues in terms of not wanting a, um, a service in the area that may cater to uh, people who are specifically on parole um, and that you have any issues in that area. Yeah. We really haven't had any issues, and we specifically chose a community that has very high rates of people returning back from prison. Um, it's a predominantly African-American community in the city and is either the largest, has, I think it has the largest group of people returning back from prison. So this is an issue that touches on many of the people in the community. Many of the staff at the clinic are from the community, so it impacts their family members as well. And that's been actually a tremendous support for us in the clinic because, um, you know, we are operating in a larger clinic, so it's important that the staff uh, are sensitive to the needs and the experiences of our clients as well. And we have found that actually uh, because many of our staff uh, understand this, this, the system of incarceration because it's touched on their lives in one way or another, um, they're actually very supportive of the work that we do and their patients and really um, have gotten just tremendous support uh, from the community that we're based in. Uh, 
You know, I just wanted to follow up with what Sherry just said, which is that in, you know, the transitions clinic that we newly started up in New Haven as well, we had the same process where we did focus groups trying to find out where formerly incarcerated individuals wanted to have this clinic and ended up in uh, a local community health center here as well uh, and have found, uh, again, no difficulties within the community, within community members or patients by the same process, you know, so really uh, going to the patients first, uh, engaging community organizations, and then finding a, a community health center and a community uh, which would be kind of receptive uh, to the needs of this uh, population and starting a program like this. Great, thank you. Um, a question came through uh, about HIPAA um, and whether or not that has been uh, problematic or created any barriers and um, sort of specifically how you're working with, I guess, healthcare service providers who are behind the walls inside the prisons. Uh, so, you know, for HIPAA, um, it really hasn't created a barrier. Uh, we've spent, it, I think it's a challenge for our community health workers um, because they're from the community, because they're working so closely, and because they're working with ancillary community organizations. Um, we do a lot of training around HIPAA and talk constantly, and I let Ron wait, and he's sort of rolling his eyes because I'm constantly um, on them talking about HIPAA, uh, making sure that we protect our patients' confidentiality. You know, we do work closely with parole at times. You know, for instance, we had a patient with really severe rheumatoid arthritis, a young man who was out of care for years because he absconded from the law and was afraid to, um, couldn't access uh, Medicaid services because he had a warrant for his arrest. So we had to work very closely with parole. Um, we just make sure that we get permission from our clients before we do that. Um, they sign releases before we give out any medical information and all of our communications are HIPAA compliant. Um, when it comes to working inside the prison system, um, HIPAA actually doesn't apply in the prison system, interestingly. Uh, but we work very hard to just make sure that, you know, again, we maintain patients' confidentiality. Um, we are very fortunate to have a large prison close by in the Bay Area that um, is providing really sort of releasing many of the patients that are coming to us to begin with. Um, and also we're very fortunate to have uh, medical staff and the warden who supports us coming in and connecting with our patients beforehand. And I actually um, have worked inside the prison system and had uh, was able to kind of help use that as a connection to the prison to be able to start seeing our patients uh, before they're released. Uh, but here in California, the idea of releasing more and more people to reduce overcrowding um, is being addressed. I think the, the system realizes that it's really critical to partner with the community and, and start making these connections to help people transition well out of prison and stay in the community. Has the uh, model in San Francisco or in some of the other replication sites um, included, in addition to the community health worker, any other um, sort of peer guided or peer support services um, or mentoring services as a uh, part of the uh, healthcare model? Um, I mean, I think you know, we formally have the community health workers in our clinic, but we have interns who come through that we train. Uh, so in that regard, um, they're then also going to whatever job they're going to work in or work in the community sort of with that training. Um, and, you know, other formal programs around peers or mentoring, um, we don't have based out of our clinic, but many of the services in the community have those type of components of peer mentoring or case managers or other community support. Um, for those individuals. So it's really just a matter of tailoring the service. If someone has intensive case management or mentorship um, in other places, that means that our community health workers, um, that's maybe a role that they're going to be less useful in, but could find other things to help support the patients and their transitions back. So, you know, we don't have other formal peer mentoring programs through our clinic, but do connect with many community organizations that do. Um, in the San Francisco site or in any other the replication sites, um, are you able to do outreach to individuals who are coming out of local county jails as well as the prisons? 
Okay, so I'm going to pass this over to Ron. The question is about out outreach to individuals in the county jail. Um, I guess about the only outreach I really do in the county jail is the ones that uh, some of our clients end up going back. And before they go back to prison, they end up in the county jail. A lot of them are, you know, awaiting trial. So I go down there and visit them at the county jail, you know. But uh, we've been thought about going in there and uh, teaching some class classes, uh, especially at the female population. So I uh, think about uh, the other, uh, my coworker, Ms. Alvarado, is going to be uh, teaching some classes for the female population. But uh, I go there and visit almost maybe every other two weeks I go visit somebody right before they get ready to go to prison. So, you know, that's usually my outreach to the uh, county jail. I, you know, I, I was just going to say also, just in follow-up to that, I mean, one of the reasons, you know, when we did create this model, we were thinking about uh, what would be the most efficacious model and also uh, what is the biggest need. And, you know, there are many models uh, centered, not many, but there are models out there centered around primary care uh, in Hampton County, for instance, or in Rhode Island as well, where they work closely with local jails. And the difference between our model and that model is that the providers move in and out of the jail system back into the community. And so for a locale like San Francisco, that would make a lot of sense that, uh, you know, that the same providers that care for the individuals in the community also could then go into the jails, whereas that's not possible within the prison system. And so we've really focused um, kind of at least our initial startup efforts and, and the building of this model around something that didn't exist before, something that, you know, uh, could be replicated nationally uh, in states where geographically the prisons are very widespread uh, and then individuals would be returning back to communities where they wouldn't otherwise have health care access. Um, a question has come through on uh, something you touched in, touched on briefly in your presentation, um, but wanted to maybe just have you emphasize it again. Um, and it touches on sort of how um, likely it is that your primary care physicians um, who receive a referral of a patient from the transition clinic have the capacity to deal with the cultural characteristics of these patients, um, and does there need to be a special orientation for physicians to better serve um, the justice involved population? I think um, I think that the answer is yes. There actually needs to be um, a greater orientation. Um, you know, the three of us um, who have uh, medical degrees went through medical training and had very little exposure to these types of populations, or um, in terms of the delivery models, in terms of the, the needs of this population. I think that um, it, it was a major sort of uh, missing component of our education, along with many others. But um, it was one of the, the, the clear uh, issues that we, the three of us, have addressed in our local communities by giving numerous talks to residents, um, faculty, and other um, providers in our area, um, as well as medical students. And um, uh, over the course of the five or six years that we've been really uh, doing this work, and I think that it's a critical uh, piece to that. I mean, and the challenge is how do we um, educate providers across the country um, on this population and the needs of this population? And I think that it does go beyond the model. I think the cultural competence and sensitivity, um, you know, going beyond community health workers being integrated within the practice, um, is, it, it is really important, and I think the central tenets of, of cultural competent uh, delivery of care um, sort of apply, but also I think there's a lot of education that needs to be done. So the ways that we'll sort of step forward and um, try to take a leadership role in this, besides giving talks within our local communities, is to um, really try to develop um, the capacity to do web-based and um, other uh, educational, uh, uh, create other educational opportunities for providers that are trying to implement this and settings that may be more remote from um, from providers like us that are giving these talks in local ne uh, neighbor neighborhoods and um, and really working perhaps uh, down the line to really integrate this type of training into medical education. Um, and there are a lot of changes coming uh, down the pipe, and I think there will be opportunities there. Thank you. Um, a question came through about uh, related to sort of the um, prevalence that you 
in regards to hepatitis C um, and is somewhat related whether you're able to do any kind of overdose prevention activities uh, for your clinic. So in California, we actually have staggeringly high rates of hepatitis C. It's been documented in studies up to 40%. So uh, it's a, an issue that we do see all the time in our clinic um, and are able to uh, refer patients to a, a great program at San Francisco General Hospital that does a lot of education and support of patients who uh, decide to go ahead and be treated for hepatitis C. Um, and as far as sort of overdose prevention, um, you know, we do a lot of education with our patients um, and try and discuss, you know, sort of harm reduction methods, how to prevent overdose, and then also try to actively treat our patients uh, for substance abuse disorders. Um, in particular, we do um, we do keep patients on maintenance of oxone in the clinic, so for our heroin users, uh, can treat them with that and and really try and address these issues. Um, and kind of as we mentioned, we do go into the prison and meet the clients before they're released. So it's a a really important opportunity to talk about this with patients who are at high risk of overdose and sort of what are actual things that they can do, practical measures they can take to prevent overdose. And uh, several questions came through about um, the assessment tools that you're using for people um, as they're coming into the clinic and whether they're um, what tools you use, sort of are there specific ones that you think are helpful in regards to addressing sort of the primary care issues um, that people who are coming uh, back into the community from prison may have, um, if you could maybe touch on uh, some of those issues. So we're not using any specific assessment tool. I think um, as primary care providers, um, you know, we're focusing on individuals with a history of chronic conditions, sort of trained to um, get sort of medical history and background around those chronic conditions in addition to substance abuse and mental health disorders. And then sort of, as I mentioned and I talked about what our initial visit includes, um, it's a lot of getting information from the patient and sort of individualizing what their issues are and what some of their risks are um, sort of in conjunction with the community health workers. And I think you saw in that picture of the community health workers um, sometimes in the room with us sort of having a conversation as a group. Um, we actually have a screening tool that we use that we develop to make sure that we hit on all of the key issues, but um, at this time are not using any sort of standardized uh, tool um, in addressing some of the issues that our patients have upon return to the community. Um, so many questions <laughs> trying to pull out. So, um, there were a few that came through in regards to access to services generally, and whether or not um, you ever struggle to uh, provide services to people. Are there individuals who uh, you cannot provide services for? Um, and then a question specific to sort of uh, mental health treatment, um, such as psychiatry. Um, given sort of the budget cuts that states are facing, are you experiencing any problems there um, in regards to whether what you're doing on site or the referrals that you're providing for people? Yeah, great question. Um, as far as kind of access to services, uh, we are in a county-based safety net system. So um, as far as getting the patients into primary care, we um, the, really the main barriers are if they're not uh, in San Francisco residents, then um, we're really not able to provide services for them. But there are many services that we would like to provide for our clients that are difficult to access or not very available in the community. And um, dental care, for instance, is a, a, a significant um, service that we face barriers to. We have basic dental care out of our clinics, but for more extensive care, um, it's really challenging to be able to provide care for those patients. Um, for instance, dentures are not covered by the services in our system. So we do have a patient care fund where uh, we've, we've raised some funds to have in that to be able to uh, support patients who need specific services or durable equipment that isn't covered um, through the county program or through um, their Medicaid or Medicare. So I'm trying to you know, sort of recognize that there are some things that um, are essential for our patients but, but not covered. 
Uh, mental health services are extremely challenging to obtain for patients. Um, in California, though, for people who are severely mentally ill, they have a requirement to go to a parole outpatient clinic to access mental health services. So for those clients, they have access to care for the time that they're on parole. But um, once they're off parole, we are still faced with the challenge of integrating them into mental health services in San Francisco. Based at our clinic in San Francisco, we do have a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and a few social workers to help support our patients as well. But um, kind of as you alluded to, you know, resources are scarce and it's very challenging. So um, that is something that we oftentimes are finding ourselves uh, faced with trying to get more extensive services for patients uh, beyond the sort of primary care-based mental health services that we can provide as primary care providers. Okay, great. And with that, um, I think we are coming up on our hour and a half. I, again, want to thank our presenters um, for taking the time to spend with us today and um, taking all the time to answer the questions. I think it's been very helpful for um, the participants that we had on the line today. Um, and with that, uh, this concludes our webinar on essential elements of reentry, primary care, and the transitions clinic approach. Um, I apologize to the questions that we didn't get to um, today, but you have the uh, contact information for each of the presenters, so please feel free to follow up with them directly. Um, I want to thank you all for your attendance and participation, and of course, thank you to the Bureau of Justice Assistance for sponsoring this event, and again, um, a third or fourth big thank you to our uh, presenters today. Um, as a reminder, a recording of the presentation and slides will be available online uh, in the next few days on our website, uh, which again is www.nationalreentryresourcecenter.org. And finally, when you leave this event, a brief survey on the webinar will pop up on your screen, um, and we would very much appreciate your feedback. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your day.